The Holy Ghost is still very much present. Jesus is very much present. So let's, uh, let's talk to him, shall we? Lord, you are present. Thank you, Father. Thank you for meeting with us, touching us. So, Lord, we want to pray as we go through your gospel, as we look at how, Lord Jesus, when you walked on this earth, some of the things that you did, how you touched people's lives. I ask, Lord, that we will be touched by the stories so we can touch others. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, uh, last week, spoke two weeks ago, finished off Mark chapter 1. Can we remember what we sort of learned? I'm saying learning. The problem is when you're doing the gospel teaching, you're doing a lot of journeying, a lot of narrative, just storytelling and, and applying it in some way. And one of the quotes that uh, I picked up uh, or was using a lot, which I discovered later on, was tweeted, whatever that is, was tweeted. No, I do know what tweeting is. I've got that right. It's tweeting, isn't it? Good. Cackled or something. Anyway. And it, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yes. Something may seem a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. Something may seem a good thing to you doesn't mean it's a God thing to do. What was going on, if you remember, the disciples were seeing is the fact that they wanted to get Jesus to do what they wanted him to do. When they seeked him, Seeking in Mark's gospel is not a good thing to do when you're seeking Jesus. It's a negative uh, connotation because what they're doing, they're hunting him down and saying, come on, back to what we want you. We want to cage you and you do what we want. Almost, sort of, that's sort of where I reflected afterwards. I thought it's almost like they want him to be a circus performer for them. They didn't quite pick up what he was there for. So he's the sort of, uh, and out comes our miracle worker. Da-da! And that's what they sort of wanted with this Jesus. They almost were caging him, trying to tie him down, and he was having none of it, obviously. He's about doing God's work. And it's, as I said, our way of doing it is, Lord, this is what I'm doing. Please come and bless what I'm doing. And that's the wrong thing. It's God, what are you doing? Let us come and join you in that. And that's what it should be. That's mission. That's our whole lives. God, what are you doing I'm going to come and join you in that. So this is what they were trying to do. So what happened at the end of Mark 1, if you may remember, we left Jesus completely unable now to enter any town freely because of the disobedience of the leper who he cured. The leper who couldn't keep his gob shut and decided to tell everybody about what this Jesus had done. He didn't bother following the Torah law as Jesus told him to do so. He didn't bother going off to the official so he could be officially included into the community again. He decided to go run off his mouth and tell everybody what had done. I've always got a good question about that. Did he actually get re-included properly back into the community? Did he actually go off and do eventually what he was meant to have done, which is go to the priests at the temple and say, hi, look, I've been cured. For them to write him a note to such and say, yeah, you're now signed off sick, you can go back to work. I'm a bit flippant about it, but did he actually bother and go and be re-included properly back into the community? Still an interesting thought. One of those sidelines questions always gets your your box ticking. Because if you don't do exactly what Jesus asked you to do, then you've not done what he wants you to do. It's that clear cut. If he's called you to go whole hog on something, can you go a little bit? You see, in the Old Testament, this is none of this is in my notes. You see that in the Old Testament. When he told the Israelites, go and wipe this lot out. Well, they didn't. They spared some. So what happens? The Israelites become then eventually themselves contaminated, intermarried, do all the wrong things. God's unhappy with them, strangely enough. This is the same God in Jesus. So you have to tell, you have to do exactly as he asks all the way. Because if you don't, it doesn't get fully completed. So just sideline. Jesus did actually adhere to some of the structures and the rules of temple of his day because it wasn't going against what God wanted. 
So we always have this view that he just wiped out everything to do with God's, uh, with the temple rules or the way of getting cleansed. He didn't. If it was in the Torah and it was, wasn't a burden to somebody, he followed it. It's very clear. Temple tax. Oh, well, cut the coins and a fish. Go pay it. He hid. He didn't sort of scrap everything. So we have to be careful. Jesus was incredibly subversive, but he did follow some of the rules. Anyway, Mark chapter 2. Ready? Let's hope this computer works. Ready? When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door, while he was preaching God's word to them. Four men arrived, carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. We're just going to stop there for a second. So this is several days later. Jesus has actually returned back to where he's staying. Remember, it's Peter's house or sorry, Simon at this moment, who's called Peter, eventually, staying in his house. And if you remember the way the houses are built, sort of quadrant type thing, with all the front doors facing into the main quadrant, and the way you get into the quadrant is to go through like a little bit of an archway of a tunnel. Imagine a shopping precinct. Yes, I finally found the link. Imagine a shopping precinct. You go in via the main doors, don't you? And normally it can be, I think about the one in Uxbridge, the, the old one, uh, pavilions. You can go into the main doors and they've got big quadrant squares. And all the shop doors are facing inward to the quadrant. So next time you walk into one of those sort of places, it goes, oh, Peter's house. <laughs> and what's happened with the layout of houses is that they had stairs on the outside. And the stairs would lead up to a flat roof. Because everybody sort of lived underneath with the animals sometimes and stuff like that. I just want to make that clear to you because there's one of the things you've got to appreciate. When this, everybody knows this story. This is one of the most well known stories. So I want to go sideline on it. So the house is crowded, the quadrant is probably full to the brim with people trying to listen or see a miracle of Jesus. Do wonder if they really want to listen to the message or they actually want to just see a miracle. Take it as you want. So they're cramming. They can't do anything. Jesus has gone home. Can't get a rest for love nor money because everybody wants to see him. I can understand that. So these four guys carrying a friend we don't know, probably a friend, up with him paralyzed. They clearly think this Jesus is going to heal him, but they can't get him in. So they ingeniously think, oh, let's go up the outstairs and remove the roof. Think about it for a minute. Now, the roof was made of mud. Uh, There was lattice across them, and then it was packed mud with other things. And that's how the roofs were made. And, of course, eventually you would have to put more mud on it uh, to to keep it updated. So when it says here they were digging, they literally were digging out the mud out of the roof to lower him in. Now, you ever thought about this? So they're digging the mud out. Jesus is preaching, and all of a sudden, mud starts falling on everybody, including Jesus. It would have fallen on him as well, by the way. Don't think there'd been some amazing moment of an angel hanging over him going, oh, not upon the Holy One. Mud would have hit him. And he probably looked up and went, well, I'll stop preaching for a while then. Wait till this is over and done with. Now imagine Simon, who's called... It's his house. If you were Peter, what would you be thinking right now? As somebody's removing your roof. Yeah. Oi. What do you think you're doing? You better put that back afterwards. <laughs> you ever thought of that? Ever looked at it? We just go, oh yeah, remember the paralyzed man reducing the mat. But think about the other disciples' reactions upon somebody's faith really pushing the boundaries for them. We know the end of the story and we all think, oh, that was good. But we don't actually then see them go, and what he did was return back and put the hole back in the roof. Just think that through. 
So I just want to note that dirt was falling on Jesus. I was always curious, what was Peter thinking in that moment? I know what I would be thinking, and I was being polite. So we have that moment of them lowering him in his mat and Jesus turning in and saying, my child, your sins are forgiven. Firstly, my child is not some condescending statement. It is a true term of endearment, but with an authoritative edge to it. So he's not being condescending. Uh, He's not treating the person like somebody less than him as such, but there is a sense of I'm authority, my child, welcome, that sort of thing. Uh, so I just thought I'd mention that. Your sins are forgiven. Well, that's probably maybe not what the guy wanted to hear, so we think. He's paralyzed. It's a bit obvious what he really wants, surely. But is it? This will be the only time you see that Jesus makes a point in healing, seems to compare the fact that you're ill because of sin. That's what that parallel looks like. The reason that Jesus got to say your sins are forgiven is so that until your sins are forgiven, I can't heal you. But he seems to make a direct correlation here between sickness and that is a result of sin. Now, actually, that can be true. And let me explain why that is in a moment before you start thinking what am I saying. The man might need to have faith and might well have needed to repent before Jesus could come along and then heal him. There might be something in his life that he needed to be repent of that is not at all connected with him being paralyzed. But he might have needed to hear somebody saying, your sins are forgiven. He needed to repent of something. Maybe, and he knew what was going on. Maybe as his friends are faithfully putting him down there, he's going down thinking, well, this ain't gonna happen because I did this back then. Do you see the point? His friends are trying to get him healed. It could be their faith. And he's sitting there as he's going down. Something I can't confess to anybody. And you get that moment. And then Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. No, 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 no. He's come here for for being paralyzed. He's come for healing. Can you imagine people going, no, no, Jesus, you got it wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, look, look, it's a bit obvious. He needs to be healed. And Jesus is saying, actually, no. The deeper thing that needs to be sorted, he needs to know he's forgiven. Ever feel like that? I did this thing so long ago, there's no way God's going to do anything for me ever again. Hmm. Maybe you need to hear that you're forgiven. Now, let's tackle this. There is this strange, uh, well, no, not strange. In one level, it's right. That uh, in, in the Judaism time and today, in lots of areas. If you're sick, it's because there's a sin in your life. Please, really? We're sick because we We live in a broken, fallen world. That's why we're sick, mass, vast majority of us. Now, there are elements that maybe you're injured. Um, you become injured in a car accident, for instance. And so, therefore, you have a long-term sickness. Oh, a bad joint or something now. And the reason the car accident happened was because you were breaking the law by going at a stupid speed that you knew you shouldn't have been. I think you could say that is a direct result of you breaking the law. That's you sinning against the law of the land, which God says you can obey the law of the land as long as it doesn't go against God's word. Last time I checked, speeding is is something that God doesn't say is part of his kingdom. So if you're speeding and breaking the law of the land, do you expect the punishment from it, like the speeding ticket? It's no good going, oh Lord, look at this, what did I do wrong? So if you have a major car accident and you're long-term sick from that, there is that sort of correlation. We do have some responsibility. It's just one uh, example. But most sicknesses and illnesses, I would say, is not a direct result of a sin. It's because we fall in a broken world that is sinful anyway. But this is the first time that Jesus makes this direct link. And also in Luke, 
Jesus actually refutes the fact that it is due to them anybody's sin that the person is blind. It's because of God's glory. Do you understand? So Jesus is never saying that. He's always breaking against that. But I still hear it today with people say, oh, you're sick because of a sin in your life. What? No. Just thought I'd make that clear. Son of man. Oh, no, I haven't got to rest the verses before I get to that. Verse 6 is, uh, yeah, I know, when you suddenly realize, verse 12. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what are you saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Well, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. So I prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. I am not going to go. We know the fact that the Pharisees believe that only God can forgive sins, which is true. Their problem was they couldn't understand that Jesus was God in human form. But I can understand that. Disciples still didn't get it until after his death and resurrection and his ascension. And still didn't really get it until a few more years later. But Jesus uses this term, son of man. Now, we tend to just accept it now as a term of phrase and go, oh, yeah, that's Jesus talking about himself. But when I can find the right... There it is, verse 10. Problem is, Jesus was using it for himself. The problem was it wasn't a political or religious term. It was sort of fairly neutral, really. So that's why nobody reacted when he used it. Remember I said in Mark, there is this secrecy motif. Jesus trying to keep it quiet about who he really is. So we sit and go, yeah, but then he uses the term son of man. And we sort of know what that means from Daniel 7. And we sort of understand that's like the anointed one of God. And and this sort of sense of this this heavenly being, this God uh, uh, imagery from Daniel 7. But for them at this time, it meant nothing particularly. It was a non-political, non-religious term. So they just sort of would have let it go by. It's not really until afterwards that everybody looks back and go, oh yeah, do you remember when he said that? That's what he was alluding to, that he's God. Do you ever get that? You look back after a while and went, oh yeah, I see what Jesus was doing in my life. Same sort of thing. So when we look at this and we think, surely the Pharisees should have picked it up then what he's getting at. No, because to them at that time, it meant really nothing. It's not until afterwards, and you look back, you go, oh yeah. Now we know why he kept using that term. And again here, we have Jesus preaching proclamation backed up with power. Just to prove that I can forgive sins. Walk. Walk. Just to prove everything I've been saying so far this evening that you've all been sitting listening on to until the mud started falling from the roof. So you can understand that I've backed out what I'm talking about, the kingdom of God. Walk. Throughout the whole of Mark and and Matthew and Luke, you will see Jesus backing up everything he says with power. Something the church in the West is missing. Because we're not open to it enough. So stand up, pick up your mat and go home. So the man does it. Jumps up, grabs his mat and walks out. Could you imagine that? Have you ever really imagined that for a moment? Stand up where you're at. I can imagine the guy going, what? Okay, sins are forgiven. This is a good day so far. Think about it. I've been touched by Jesus. My sins are forgiven. 
Ooh, and now I can physically walk. Jumps up. I haven't used these in a long time. Grabs his mat. Could you imagine him walking out? Check this out. Yeah, woo. Everybody, the crowd parting like the Red Sea. Wow, we've never seen anything like this before. Noting this entire thing, he never once actually thanks Jesus. In this telling of the gospel, he has not turned around and said, thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus did just tell him, get up, get out and go home. But you normally, politely, would turn around to somebody and say, thanks for having me, had a lovely time, and then go home, wouldn't you? Hmm? Was he? He was shocked, was he? No, I know. But I think I still, even I would have turned around and gone, thank you. Though I can relate to it slightly. And ready? This is right, because Carol's correct. Ready for this? I knew you was going to come out of that, Barry. Bless you. Fine. Next time I kick you out of my house, I don't expect to thank you, okay? <laughs> and the next time you kick me out of your house, don't expect to thank you from me. <laughs> but I'm just trying to get at the something here. Something miraculous has happened, and you would have hoped there'd be some report that he at least said thank you or went back afterwards. Whatever. But he was, the, all the other people were praising God. But I think he did get excited. And this is the story behind it. I remember when the consultant turned around to me and said, right, that's it. Your rheumatoid arthritis is no longer on. It's all gone. You can stop the medication. That's it. I literally, it was a meeting I was not expecting to have. I was expecting to see him and for him to say, wow, yep, still up. Blood tests are telling it's still not going well, blah, blah, blah. But I knew I was pain free, but I didn't understand why. And I thought, oh, it's just one of those things, and it's just because the medication's at the right level or something. And when he turned around, he said, oh, no, it's all gone. Oh, okay, thanks. Stop the medication. Yeah, stop the medication. Okay, so as I walk out Northwick Park Hospital, and I did thank the consultant, but it wasn't him that cured me, if you know what I mean. But as I walked out of the hospital, I remember walking out, going along the park. Anybody that works at Northwick will know exactly where I am. You go to the multi-story car park. Best hospital because it has a multi-story car park. As you walk out, and I walked along the road, and I got to the multi-story, paid for the ticket in the machine, got up the stairs, got in the car, sat in the car, and then went, oh yeah, thank you, Lord. It took that long to realize what had happened. And then I phoned Joy, who didn't believe me, and then until I said, no, it's true. And so you can walk in a little bit of shock. But I think here, with this particular person, the fact he jumped up, grabs his mat, etc. I think there should be sometimes a bit of maybe we're not as grateful as we are, should be to our Lord. But I omit that one to you because I was walking out in a daze. And then I couldn't stop thanking him all the way home. And in the process, I think he was making sure that he was steering the car so I didn't have an accident. I wasn't speeding. So, there's too many speed cameras. Right, moving on. But I just want us to take note. They've never seen anything like this before. Didn't stop it happening, though, did it? They were open to it. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. Just note that in brackets. But 
When the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples. No, they didn't ask Jesus. They asked his disciples. Why does he eat with such scum? I like the NLT version. It's not polite. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. There is a parallel calling here. Jesus again is walking along the lake shore, as he was when he called his first church. In Mark, Simon who's called... James and John and Andrew, walking along, he called them in exactly the same way. Come, follow me. So he does exactly the same to Levi, who is? Matthew, thank you. Levi is Matthew, so you'll discover eventually. And his response is exactly the same as Simon, who is? Andrew, James, and John. Exactly the same response. When Jesus says, follow me, Levi goes, okay, and follows him. The response is no different. But what is the differences between the calling? There are two distinct differences in my view. Well, not two, but there is distinction between them. Firstly, Simon, who's called... Oh, come on, that's a bit fun, isn't it? Okay. Andrew, James, and John were businessmen. They were fishermen, but they had to trade in business. It wasn't they just went, remember, they didn't just go and fish and whatever. They had to trade, get the best price for their goods. It's almost like, um, is it Smithfields that's the fish place? It's like Smithfields in London. Lots of trading. Huh? Bill, that's it, thank you, dear. Billingsgate, yes? Billingsgate. I'm just... So it's like Billingsgate... They have to negotiate the best price of their fish every day. And they were businessmen. They were people who would clearly be seen as respectable. Levi, who's called, was actually a tax collector. Not like a tax collector of today. With computer screens and a desk. He was in his booth. He was classed as a, basically a traitor to his own people. He collaborated with the enemy to gain wealth. He was the scum of the earth to his own people. It is almost, and I couldn't find the closest, but this was about the closest you're going to, I could think of. Imagine you're in, well, imagine this is Second World War and you're, a Jewish person and you're portraying your own people to the Germans. That is what it's equal to. That's how they would have considered him. Outcast of outcasts. He was more outcast than the leper. Because the leper, even though he was an outcast while he was ill, it wasn't his fault. Here, Levi made the choice to be a tax collector really makes him an outcast of outcasts. Plus, the leper could be cured and somehow come back into the society. Really, for the Jewish, there's no such way for Levi. No such way for a tax collector. That's it. You are scum. So then to have this rabbi come up to you and say, come follow me, Now, here's the thing for you. Why did Levi just immediately leave his booth? And this is a real question. Think for a minute. Why did Levi go and got up and followed Jesus? He heard about Jesus? Yeah, but... Sorry? 
because it was a command, that probably wasn't it. Because it wasn't really a command, it was more of an invite. Got some hands up. Will. He was an outcast, and here was somebody inviting him to join him. Well, maybe he saw the light. Probably not yet. It'd be nice to have that view, Dennis, but we've got to recognise if they couldn't, if even the closest disciples couldn't recognise Jesus for who he was when they walked with him for three years until that moment of transfiguration on the mountain, there is, the Levi just wouldn't have seen the light. What he would have seen, exactly what? Somebody was saying, a rabbi, a teacher, saying to him, come and join me. Come and be included in my little circle. You're, you are welcome. I have no illusions about what and who you are at the moment. Come and join me. That's an invite that is open to all of us today. I have no illusions about you, says God, but come and join me. I'll sort the rest of it out later. Just, just come and join me now. Your sins are forgiven. Come and join me. Paralyzed? I don't worry about that. We'll sort it out later. Let's sort out the sins first. And by the way, they're forgiven because of what I did on the cross. But just, just come and join me. Come and be included. Come and take of this now. Be included. Stop making yourself an outcast. You are making yourself an outcast. Nobody else. You are doing that. I'm inviting you in. It's an offer that is open to us all the time. I think that's the first time there is somebody in this room that's the first time they have heard that you are making yourself an outcast Jesus is saying just come and join in that's you this morning you have a response to make maybe you want to see me afterwards and then this takes it even further Levi, who by the way is going to be seriously wealthy invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax, collect sorry, tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. I just love that. It's such a line we skip over because it's in brackets. Have you noticed how you, when you're reading something, a book or whatever, you always skip over the brackets. You sort of skim through them sometimes. You go, oh, that's not important to the whole context. Well, actually, this is. The scum of the earth were following Jesus. The scum of the earth were following Jesus. At which point you're going to sit there and say, oh yeah, well it's the criminals, it's the whatever else. You're ready for this. It's them plus us. Do you know why? Because sinners to a Pharisee, which is where this term's coming from, is basically anybody who's not following their oral traditions or their rules or trouncing all over the Torah. That's all it means. It's not just the criminals. We're the scum of the earth. And Jesus invited us in, and the vast majority of us accepted it in this room, and we're following Jesus. So when you read that, don't just think it's the criminals or your, your tax collector. Don't have a go at the inland revenue. Don't be thinking it is the worst of our society because it's not just them, it's us. But the invitation is open and equal to everyone. Nobody, nobody 
is not able to join into Jesus' following. I don't care what they have done. They can repent, have faith, follow Jesus, and be included. It is very easy for us to look at something like a certain paper that's closely related to posting something called the mail. <clears throat> or any newspaper or any news, news article or anything and pick it up and see their headlines and think, well, those people are just not redeemable. Jesus would never want them in. Wrong. So we need to be open to inviting them in. I've just got a great imagination for a minute for you. Imagine the four disciples, shock and horror. Because by the way, the, 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 the normal, the, the, the businessmen disciples, the ones who were clearly okay in their society, they would have had to have followed Jesus into the tax collector's home and be with the scum of the earth. Could you imagine the trauma they're going through right now? Remember, this is a high, high shame and honor society. By going into Levi's home, they've just become ritually unclean in the eyes of the Jews. They have just become people who need to seriously go and get cleansed. They've become outcasts now. Imagine their reaction. Imagine your reaction if you're suddenly asked to go into a place that is today classed as not a place for respectable people to go to. I noted the inverted commas. And as Edwards puts it, following Jesus involves an act of risk and cost. Following Jesus is something one does, not just what one now thinks and believes. And in verse 17 is the most obvious statement that we all know from Jesus, that it's not the healthy that need fixing it's the sick, and these are who I have come for. I have not come called the righteous, but those who are sinners. Now, let's make this clear. This does not mean that none of the... Re he was talking more to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who thought they were righteous because they studied the Torah and they followed these set of rules that, by the way, they put into place. And we'll come to them in a minute. And they thought they're righteous. And he said, of course, I can't save the righteous. I can't call you because you think you're sorted. Until you actually get it that you're a sinner and you need me or you need God, at least at this point, he's thinking, you can't be saved and I can't call you because your cup is already full. Know anybody like that? There is plenty in our families and our friends, etc., who think they're okay. And we're wondering why they're not turning to Jesus. It's because they think they're okay. Yeah. They think if they give their five or a year to children in need, they've done their bit. I'm being up front. Anyway, let's carry on. Once when G, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Now, this is an insert story. That once tells us, this is Mark just suddenly saying, oh, by the way, this didn't happen immediately after the eating with Levi. This didn't happen. This is just, oh, sideline. I want to show you something really important. Um, just, just you to get a, a hang on this. So that's what this is about. This is him showing the conflict that Jesus has with the Pharisees. And there's a reason why, and it does appeal to us, so bear with me. Once, when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Note, it's not the Pharisees that are talking to Jesus, it's the people. This is the common people. The everyday person. Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them. 
But someday, someday, the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. I want us to look at the Pharisees. And I'm just going to sort of read this, really. They'd been around for two centuries before Jesus was born. Their name literally means separated one or holy ones. The Pharisees were completely and utterly against the prevailing Hellenistic Greek culture that was there. And they didn't want to change their Jewish lifestyle to accommodate Greco-Roman ideals. They believe in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Or they call them Moses' books, which was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They believe that these were the precious instrument by which the world was created. All wisdom of God and his will and, and the surpassing object of human existence is are in those five books. They weren't political. They actually weren't particularly bothered by political rulers as long as they were allowed to live their lifestyle, establish their life based on the Torah and that wasn't invaded. They didn't care about what political person ruled them. They only made up about 1% of the Jewish nation. But against the other parties, like the Sadducees, the Ensigns, the Herodians, and the Zealots, they had the most influence amongst the common people. They were known for their high ideals. and We'll give gum to those in a moment. They were the only party to have survived intact after the Roman, the war with Roman, uh, with the the Roman war, that's not coming out. The war that happened in Jerusalem between the Romans and the Jews in AD 66 to 70, they're the only party that came out of it as such intact. And all Judaism today owes its origins back to the Pharisees. They believed in the sovereignty of God. Now prick up your ears because this might sound like us in a minute. They believed in the sovereignty of God, human accountability for virtue and vice, the resurrection of the dead, angels and demons. Well, they believed in total adherence to the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and their own oral traditions to which it was based upon. And they had an extreme disdain for anyone who were ignorant, negligent, or violators of the Torah. So basically anybody that wasn't them. And you ready for this? This is the kicker, as yeah, somebody I know would say. Jesus stood closer to the foundational belief of the Pharisees than any of the other Jewish parties. Do you hear me? The people he was in conflict with a lot in Mark, he stood closer to them in, their fa in foundational belief with them. As I said, it sounds like us, doesn't it? We believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe in angels and demons. We believe in reading the Bible and the word of God. Yeah, not total adherence to, I noticed that. Notice I rephrased it slightly. And we believe in human accountability for virtue and vice. If you sin, it's your fault. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you have the potential to never sin again. Remember I told you, Jesus didn't sin, not because of his divinity, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit living in him. 
Anyway. So I thought that was a good bit kicker. Where he always come into conflict with the Pharisees was over oral tradition, the rules that they had put in place. Now you can understand some of this because they're reading something in the Torah that says, you know, Sabbath is a day of rest, for instance. Well, what does that look like? No work is to be done on the Sabbath. Define work. How many is going to go home today and do some washing? How many of you might nip off to Tesco's later? Oh, there's a bit more mumbling going on. Go and get the weekly shopping in. How many of you actually, you know, that's, we live in a 24-7 society now. So the problem is Sunday now for a lot of people is a work day. There's no such thing as Sabbath on a Sunday. Your Sabbath is elsewhere within the week. So let's not make anybody feel guilty if you've got to go off to work later. That's fully understandable now. But you are, the idea is we're trying to find a rest day for ourselves to sort of refrain from work so that we can rest, recuperate, and maybe sort of reconnect with God. That's the idea of Sabbath. So when Jesus said Sabbath was not was made for man, not man for Sabbath. He's having a go at them because you've put burdens on the people. They can't cope. You know, you weren't allowed to travel. And so it's something like you weren't allowed to do no more than about 1,999 steps. If you went to 2,000, you are working now. You've gone traveling. You was allowed to pull a donkey out of its stall or something if it was dying, if it was drowning. That was okay but you couldn't do anything else. So you was able to save lives. <sighs> That's not work. But anything else, there was all these different silly little rules. And this is what Jesus came against. This is what he really had a go on about. He was saying to them, you're putting a crushing burden on being a human being. So when it comes to the point of argument over fasting, which is what we have here, Judaism had three things, three pillars as it's called, that held them up. Prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. Judaism required one day of fast, and that was on the Day of Atonement, which lasted a full 24 hours. But oral tradition also required that at least three others happened. One for lamenting national tragedies. Two, one uh, fasting in times of crisis, such as war, plague, famine. And three, any self-imposed uh, fast for any number of personal reasons, and they should last from dawn till dusk. But it actually came out of oral tradition. Now, there's nothing wrong in it, and it's right that you know, we should fast. So I'm not going on about that. I'm not talking about fasting at the moment. We'll come to that later. Because fasting is actually good if you want to concentrate on God. That's the reason you fast. It's the idea is actually I want to focus on God. Where normally I would eat, I want to make a point of focusing on God today. That's the point of fasting. But the Pharisees normally fasted on Mondays and Thursdays every week, even though it wasn't required. Do you notice how they went completely to the extreme? So by the time we get to Jesus' day, fasting is seen as religious commitment, a sign of atonement of your sin and humiliation and penitence before God. The common people decided here, when they're asking Jesus, why, uh, the disciples, why are they not fasting like John and the Pharisees, they're effectively saying, if you want us to take you seriously, Jesus, you better do what the Pharisees do. I want to see you fasting. We want to see all that going on. But so far, we've seen you do none of that. Because it was the culture of the day. And you're not following the culture of the day. And I can imagine Jesus going, but it's not God's culture. And he uses the great wedding imagery here to explain why wedding lasts normally about seven days actually now let's go back to this just for a minute i've missed the bit here that i want to say this is the preconceived idea of what god is doing if you do a b c and d will take you seriously if you do what i expect you to do great you must be telling me something right I will follow and listen to you because you meet all of my expectations. 
that society has told me it should look like. That's not the Jesus you're following, my brothers and sisters. You're not doing something that we expect of someone who is holy and set apart by God. They didn't have a clue what it looked like to be holy and set apart in reality. Anyway. Anyway, wedding lasts about seven days for a virgin bride. I've just noticed my typo. I've got virgin bridge. Anyway, seven days for a virgin bride. Three days for a remarried widow. Friends and guests have no responsibility but to enjoy the festivities. Anybody want to get married? Let's have a seven-day one. I can enjoy just turning up, eating and drinking. Not a problem. And dancing. There's lots of food and wine, song, dance and fun. Even the rabbis are expected to stop doing any tour instruction and then join the celebration with their students. That's why Jesus was at the wedding in Cana. He was meant to be there. And yes, he was having fun. Jesus is saying that his mission is like a wedding. It's a time of hope, expectation, renewedness going on. That is the point. When you're at a wedding, you normally tend to enjoy it, don't you? Unless, of course, you actually love the bride or the groom and you're seeing them get married to somebody else. It's another ball game. But you generally enjoy the wedding, don't you? Most of us do. Unless some family infighting going on that nobody can seem to resolve. Oh, notice that wave. But generally, in a whole, most weddings, I love a good wedding. I enjoy a good wedding. It's a time of happiness, a time of joyful, a time of newness, a time of seeing two people come together and for you to go, gosh, the possibilities. And that's the same here. Join Jesus and goodness me, look at the possibilities. I might be doing a Frank in a minute and just keep preaching longer than I meant to. Because enjoy the possibilities. But he also has no illusion at some point. He's going to get taken away and killed. Then the disciples will fast. But why they're with me now and this is going on. This is a wedding, people. God's laid on a feast for the next three years. On earth, why would you want to be fasting now? Stop being silly. And probably other words to that effect. And so then he mentions... Patch of clothing or new cloth. Anybody ever put a new piece of cloth over a thing and then watched it go through the wash and then watched the, uh, the tear get worse? Because you've not pre-shrunk the original new cloth. And that's what he's going on about. And this is why he's going on about it. New wine, new wine skins. What is Jesus saying? He's simply saying this. By the way, um, once an old wine skin had been used, it had been dried up. If you've got to put new wine into it, wine ferments and expands. That's why sometimes in a wine bottle you have a little bit left in the neck. It's not all the way to the top because if you certain wines you can keep for years and years and years. It will keep still fermenting and get better. It will expand slightly. But in wine skins, good old stomach stuff, animal things, anyway, we'll leave it at that. It would dry out after a while once it's been used. You try and put new wine in it, it expand and it will crack and all the wine would go. You need to use a new wine skin, one that's supple and young and not been used yet. But this is what Jesus is saying. You don't just attach me on to what you're doing already. I'm not some sort of patch to go over the current traditions the current oral things, I'm not something you attach. I'm not here to live up to your expectations. The reason you want to see all these miracles, you're loving it, but you're not wanting to change your lives. I'm not an appendage, says Jesus. I'm not a tag on, I'm here to change your life for the better. Come and join in. I am not meant to fit into your traditions. Come and join in my new ones. It's like, I've got this image, it's like having a side extension on your house. 
Some people build side extensions, like just a spare room when it's needed. You attach it to the side of your house. And you only go in it occasionally when either you've got guests coming round, so you give it a quick hoover, and then you realise the dust, the cobwebs that have been in the corners for about, you, the rest of the house is lovely, but you haven't touched the side room. Jesus is not the side extension to your life. He's meant to take center place right in the hallway. And he's there not to give you a burden, as the Pharisees were doing with all the rules and regulations. He's there for a relationship. When he called Levi, relationship, come on in, join me. Let's have a relationship. Levi reciprocated. Come on into my house then. Come and take over. You're the head of the household now. By the way, that's what was going on when Jesus was in the rest of the story with Levi and him controlling what's going on. Jesus actually became the authority in Levi's house. Levi said, this is now yours. I, my life is now yours. Not an appendage, not a burden. As Jesus says in Matthew 11, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Not come to lay on a thick set of rules. I think we still think is a thick set of rules. Do you know the reason you're meant to read your Bible every day? Meant to be in the optative word. It's not so you think it's a burdensome duty, but so you can read it and go, oh, goodness me, is that that easy? Is that all I'm meant to do today? Follow him. Do what he's doing. Not make it up yourself. Not go and do works and say, come and bless this Lord. Let the Lord say, this is what I'm doing. Come and follow me here. The reason you're meant to pray, meant in inverted brackets, is so that you can have the relationship. If you have a friend or family or you're married, you're meant to talk to them, aren't you? I'm still learning that one. You're meant to communicate with your friends, aren't you? Apparently. And not just by text. Well, the same goes with following Jesus. Prayer is talking to him. And guess what? Him talking to you. So that you can hear what he's saying to you. And especially when he's saying things like, I love you. Your sins are forgiven. Even when you're sitting there traumatized on your hands and knees going, Lord, Lord, what have I done? Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And you said, please forgive me about 20 times. The problem is you're not listening to him going, you are forgiven. Move on. Follow me. Come on. Let's go and have some wedding fun over here. Let's go and invite those scum of the earth over there to join in. Following Jesus is not meant to be a burden, my brothers and sisters. I know it can feel like it sometimes. And we talk about sin. And it's right. There is things that we do need to correct in our lives. But let Jesus do that. Sometimes he might use the pastor to point it out to you. And your fellow brothers and sisters. But it's not because he's pointing out and saying, and I'm going to leave you to get on with it. He's going, come on, follow me. We'll sort it out as we go. Your sins are forgiven. Take up your mat and walk. And I've run well and truly over time, but I really don't care. The point of the new wine and the wineskins, by the way, is because he wants to do new things. And he can't do it if we're sticking to the rules and the traditions. He can't do it if you're sitting here locked into the same mindset that says, well, he won't use me. I'm not included in this. Yes, you are. You are outcasting yourself. And it, things, things, traditions need to go. This is... Uh, it's like having something that you do every year because you do. And you've never bothered to question Why? And the day you question why, you go, well, it's a tradition we've got. Is it actually producing any fermented wine? 
No, chuck it out. And yes, get this, might be talking about church. Not chucking the whole of church out. But God sometimes says to churches, please stop doing that. It's a tradition. Remove it. I'm doing a new thing. The old wineskin ain't going to cope with the new thing. Especially when you've got inviting the scum of the earth in. Which, by the way, is all of us. Your neighbours, your family. And the criminals. And he's saying, you can be a new wineskin. Just allow me to ferment within you. You individually and you plural. Who wants in on that? That really wasn't a rhetorical question, actually. Who actually wants in on that? Do you really want in on it? Who wants to be at the wedding? I do. I want to go every day knowing I'm at a wedding. And it's a wedding with Jesus, and I'm just going where he wants me to go. And I'm chatting to people at the table that he wants me to talk to at the wedding table, like the poor, sad, lonely person over there who's only been invited because the bride and the bridegroom felt guilty to invite them. Yet they're sat there on the table knowing nobody. We're the ones that go over there and go, hi, do you know this guy called Jesus? He really wants to invite you into a relationship with him. Come and join us. Stop making an outcast. And the person here this morning who's heard for the first time that you are the outcast, your sins are forgiven, just come and join him. Respond today. Gone well and truly over time. We'll stop. I'll tell you the story next week of something that happened to me this week. Please, will you stand? Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for your kingdom. Thank you that you've invited a scum like me to be part of this. To be invited into newness of relationship. Just no longer to be scum, but to be forgiven. To have everything washed away. And not more important, to be part of actually bringing that about for others. To be enjoying the wedding feast. I want to pray for all of us, Lord, that we do remove our traditions. We do not make you an add-on to what is going on in our lives here as individuals and our lives as a church, but we make you the centerpiece. And that we're new wineskins, Lord. I pray all of us are new wineskins. Fill us with the new wine, Lord so that people can drink of you through us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.